Hello, welcome to the seventh episode of the Northern Art Podcast with me, Ant Cosgrove. Hope you're all doing well. It's been brilliant to get out and see some exhibitions recently. Managed to go to the Hetworth a couple of weeks ago to see the excellent Barbara Hetworth exhibition that they've got them there at the moment, a humongous exhibition, well worth seeing. Also heading to London next weekend, so I'm looking forward to that. Really fancy seeing the Debuffet exhibition at the Barbican. Lucy and Friday exhibition starting soon at Tate Liverpool as well, looking forward to that. Uh, also around that area um, at the Lady Lever Gallery, there's currently a, an Augustus John exhibition on, so that should be good. Uh, yeah, and just get out and enjoy it. I'm over the moon with the guest that I've got on today. He's the first Royal Academician that I've had on the podcast, and he's also an OBE, and he's internationally acclaimed. My guest today on the Northern Art Podcast was born in Surrey in 1945. He is known for his pioneering use of wood to create groundbreaking sculptures at Blyne Fest in Yonge in North Wales, his home for over 50 years. He continues to use wood in ever inventive ways. Many works are charred as a way of reducing the sculpture to the form itself, creating depth and the absence of the material. Some works are created and exist in the landscape, such as his living sculptures, shaped to convert the natural forces while still remaining as viable growing trees. The work he produces must have an echo of the source to resonate. He feels that a tree has the four elemental forces woven into its core. Time and the different seasons are also very important to his practice. He feels that trees are a great barometer of the seasons. He is exhibited all over the world. My personal highlight was his huge exhibition at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park in 2010, which was visited by over 200,000 people. His current exhibition at Grisdale Forest Park in the Lake District revisits a location that he first worked at in the late 1970s, and we'll talk more about that today. His work is in private and public collections globally. He has pieces in the Tate, the Guggenheim in New York, the Met in New York, also the National Museum in Dublin, Tokyo Metropolitan Museum and the Victorian Albert Museum. Not bad for a man who has spent over half a century in a quiet valley in North Wales. I've been a big fan of his for many years, so you can imagine my delight in introducing you to my guest today, David Nash. Hi David, Bryn Hound Da. Yeah, hi. Thank you for doing this today. It's, um, it's a real privilege to have, to have you on today. Thank you for that. So how have you been in the past year with regards to, to COVID? Has it impacted your, your working you know, life and day-to-day routines and things? It's it's interrupted the uh, in the business side. Yes, but living in Blyne of Stinog is quite isolated in, anyway. Yeah, of course. And I have uh, an immune deficiency problem, so I need to be extra vigilant with COVID. Yeah, yeah. So my wife and I are fortunately very happy in each other's company, and uh, we live where we can walk the dog out the back. We can get exercise. The workshops are fortunately happened to have enough spaces in it so on my small crew yeah. have all got their own spaces to work in and their own facilities we just kept going it's been a, a good op- opportunity to catch up on some infrastructure aspects and archiving yeah the um the two you had the 200 seasons exhibition which took place in 2019 and 2020 which was in yeah. was at the national gallery in cardiff and then it moved to the yeah. town gallery gallery in eastbourne yeah. the timing of that exhibition was perfect, was perfect. around covid it literally yes. finished it finished in february 2020 it's like unbelievable yeah. timing yes um, yeah, yeah it was a fantastic yeah, we'd have been in a mess if we'd been shut down yeah, yeah oh yeah because i'd imagine there was so much preparation involved in that exhibition oh it? yeah it was about four years in wow before. Incredible. I mean, it was a fantastic exhibition. If anybody, anybody listening, the book um, 200 Seasons is, is really worth getting. So 200 Seasons, obviously 50 years of, of David's time at, uh, at Capel Roo, which is an incredible place um, in itself. It is a complete work of art, I think, Capel Roo, and it's something that you have developed over 50 years and doing various things to the building itself. It's just an incredible space. And the other thing, I saw you recently as well on BBC4. Um, yeah, you were on, on the, the Welsh Art. Yeah. On the yeah, on the Welsh story of Welsh Art. That was really good. That was how did that come about? Was that sort of? Oh, well, I am an artist and I live in Wales, and I was included <laughs> in the course. contemporary, in the contemporary yeah. aspect of it. And he actually, the whole series was very, very well done. It was very impressive. It's the best that's been done. Yeah, the work which Peter Lord has done in collecting what would have been very obscure Welsh artists. Yeah. Actually, bringing them to the uh for that that was a very important yeah it was good i saw uh, an ex i saw an exhibition on um in the gallery uh, clan geffney on anglesey of, of one of these artists that peter lord has championed one of these sort of 
primitive or more naive. These yeah. are term for it, isn't it for these well shot of um artists artisans artisans that's the word yeah. i'm looking for artisan artists and that was that was interesting it was interesting to see that um so yeah i did en i did enjoy that program and there were quite a number of artists that i'd not even heard of you know on, on it as well which yeah. was which is quite informative and um, so i did enjoy that so today david we are going to be discussing a residency that you had in 1978 at grisdale forest which is in the lake district uh, and also a new exhibition that you're uh, doing there which i'm looking forward to uh, hearing about but before that um, we are going to discuss your early life, really, sort of after studying um, art in London and then your move to Blind Fest in York, etc., prior to the Grisdale show. Uh, I think the story is incredible and Chapel Rue, where you congregate your work, I think is, is what you term it, yeah. is just like a work of art in itself, as I mentioned, and is is amazing. So so you're born in Surrey um, and yeah. you, grew up, you grew up there. And your, this story is that your grandparents had, a far, had pharmacies in North Wales, including in the Festiniog Valley. And your, your granddad sounds like a really interesting character. Was he a millionaire three times or something, did you say? <laughs> the, so we were led to believe, but he <laughs> had a great knack in getting money through right. entrepreneurship and then a great knack of losing it. Right, okay. <laughs> and my father and his four brothers were in and out of private school and the local school, like yeah. little yo-yos. Right, okay. Uh, then he moved to uh, London... He was from Shropshire, right? Okay. On the waters, yeah. Set up a pharmacy in Newtown, and then in Montgomery, yeah. And it was obviously a reserved occupation during the Second World War. My father and my four uncles were all born there, and they all went to the local schools there. Yeah. And then through his entrepreneurship, he uh, developed mail order pharmacy products, right? And uh, made a lot of money that way. And uh, he also branched out. He bought a lot of woolen mills, very, very cheap, because they're all being closed down and they've been empty for a long time. Converted them into little sub factories for his enterprises. Like he had one making ginger beer, right? Brilliant. And, uh, and another one making powder toothpaste. And another one doing. <laughs> something he sounds brilliant. Yeah, he is very ambitious, amazingly pompous. Uh, <laughs> he was the epitome of a English empire captain. <laughs> so not something I'm particularly proud of being. Right, okay. Yeah. But played a very big part in my life because it was yeah. something he was wild in his daring. Yeah. And my father, as a result, was very, very cautious. Okay. So I had these two influences in my life. And one example of this wild man who was I only knew him when he was old and he was retired and uh he had no pension, they were bankrupt several times and um he had enough money to buy a very rundown, but very big house with forty over forty acres of of uh, woodland right. in the Festinio Valley. They've been living in Harlech. They've been evacuated there in the Second World War. Yeah, and then he went out one day, as he did, and he came back and told his wife that they, they were moving to this uh, big house. I mean, she had had experience of, of this before, where he had actually done this but they hadn't actually completed the deal which fell through so they moved in and immediately had to move out again so that was a sort of impetuousness Fantastic. of the man you're, you're a, your dad was born wasn't he in um in north wales and so consequently yes, he, he born above the he was born above the chemist shop in newtown right okay uh yeah yeah but then he they went to uh the south of england when my grandfather moved there to set up with a partner, a department store in Regent Street, right, which had an art gallery. He had a great interest in uh, in art, um, but that went. He was swindled by his partner. He went bankrupt. And, oh, right. Um, so that was one of the, and then he had a breakdown. So right. Then he had a farm in Kent, made some money. Oh well, yeah. So it was backwards and forwards. But my father grew up in the south in yeah. his in his uh, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And in his early life, so that was in the depression. He got a job with an insurance company, yeah, uh, which he stayed with all his life. And uh, so he was a city gent with a bowler hat, commuting from Weybridge in Surrey up to London. So that was my that was my parents' life that I grew up in, which was really Weybridge is the eye of the middle English middle class. Yes, really. I believe so. Yeah, <laughs> and as I grew up, uh, we were always going up to Wales to visit the grandparents, stay with them, because we had all this freedom and lots of cousins, and they were usually there as well. So we had these 40 acres 
and more, you're going to have a great fist in your valley in environment. And yeah. We just, all our holidays were there, really. And uh, we just had adventures and, you know, it was, but it made a great impression on me because we went in the four seasons. We went at Christmas, yeah. Easter, spring, uh, summer holidays, and sometimes the uh, autumn break. Yeah. So I was, I was away doing it, doing the English middle class stuff in my education. Uh, and then we were there in Wales in this very different environment. And it was just being outside the whole time in all weathers, in all seasons. Yeah. So uh, as my consciousness grew and I began to realize what I was being brought up to be and the expectations, I really could not bear it. And, right. Um, uh, Weybridge is totally conservative. And <laughs> ownership is obviously a big thing. And yeah. I just couldn't bear it. And Wales was my only, really my only real environment that I knew and that I really liked. So while at art school, I aimed that that was where I was going to go. Was... The very economical way of leaving England, which is where I did not want to live. Right. So I went to Wales very much as a sort of hermit. I stammered very, very badly then. So social life was very difficult for me. So to bury myself somewhere, just so long as I had somewhere I could make objects yeah and i could make a living so i was pretty handy with my hands having been to art school and all through my life i always made things yeah. so i could make a living part-time doing odd jobs and uh so that's what i did and i bought capital through for just 200 pounds which is an yeah, enormous that, it, it's, it's incredible lost. I mean the um I mean the, like you say about the four seasons in, in in Wales and being there and the influence that it must have had on you. I often wonder because I have my own sort of connections with Wales. I I am love North Wales in particular. I've been going well, since I was a child basically. I don't think there's I don't think there's been a year perhaps in my adult life where I've not been at some point. I always go to I love North Wales and and Anglesey is, is kind of come on in the last perhaps 10 years but you know but with Festiniog it's one of those places that it's kind of I mean, I can imagine as a child as well, because certainly it's something I felt. Like it is a bit otherworldly because you sort of you come out of the Snowdonia mountain range and it's these amazing, you know, vistas and these huge mountains, and you you come into this grey, these grey quarries of slate and these slate tips, these man-made um, huge huge pyramids, and it's when you're a child and you see them, it's like it's over. It's something that even now I can remember as a child uh, driving through and thinking. These are just like, what is, you know, it's like being on another planet almost, you know. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's incredible. The only comparison that I made in another Welsh comparison, um, there's, a, there's a place on Anglesey uh, called Paris Mountain, which is where, yeah. the cop, where the copper was mined. Yes, yeah. If you've ever been there, that's a kind of, that sort of feeling of the other world. It's like being on Mars, basically. When you're, yes, it is, yeah, when that, that orange, yeah. Yeah, it's all orange, exactly. And so, obviously, in Festinog, it's, it's not, it's slate. In fact, when I remember when I was a child, this is probably a bit naughty, really, but when my granddad, I mean, he died when I was quite young anyway, but he, he used to take us on these day trips out randomly all around the around the country, just just for a day, me, me and my sister, because my, my, my dad worked nights and my mum worked days, and so they would opposite hours, and so my granddad would take us out. And we, um, and we, we'd go to, he'd take us all the way into Wales very uh, occasionally. And I remember driving through uh, Festiniog and him pulling over and he must have, and he wanted us to get some of the slate out of the bloody side of the, and put it in the car. And he wanted to <laughs> take some help. I don't know if it was for a rockery or something. He's got and just have this memory of like putting little bits of slate in the car. I was like, what? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that was, but I do have a big, I do have a massive connection with yeah. Wales and I can imagine the impact it must have had on you as a child. And then, and then, yeah. um, you know, and, that, and like you say, you, you then studied art. You, you studied at Brighton College, didn't you, initially, um, which was from fi uh, 59 to 63, and then you went to Kingston yeah. College of Art in 63 to 67. And were you working at sculpture at that point then, you know, you know, in, in, this, in the, when you was at Kingston? and uh, were, you, were you working on sculpture? Because I think originally it was painting, wasn't it, that you were taking? Yeah, I was a painter. I started it as a, as a painter. Where I went to school, the art department could, uh, could only do two-dimensional work. There, there wasn't any facilities for objects, and I could always draw. Right. Yeah, that, and that's a story in itself because it was something very unusual in my family, or other than my grandfather who had an interest in art, but he had yeah. no, no skills. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was actually my next door, our next door neighbors. They had children a little bit older than me. Their father was a graphic designer, and mm -hmm. so they were always had paints and paper, and I was always in their house. So I just yeah. joined in. And then because I had some facility, 
from that experience. When I was at school, I was praised. And if you're praised, then you do more. Then you get, you get a confidence. So yeah. that, that was really how that all started. And then yeah. from my father's side of the family, there was a practicality and a sense of humor. As with my mother, she was partly New Zealand and had right. a great practical practicality. Right, okay. And, um, so we, we were in, I grew up in rationing, so we had geese and chickens. We had only a little garden, but we had wild, <laughs> we grew vegetables. And my dad was always picking up a nail. If he saw a nail, he'd say it's bent. It didn't matter. He'd put it in his pocket and then... <laughs> <laughs> one of our jobs because he's always getting us employed he wasn't just alone about earning money yeah. one of the jobs was straightening nails <laughs> with, a, with a, um, a hammer and i remember when i was started building things with wood and wanting to nail them together there were always these, these jam jars full of bent nails so so that that all is part of it you do it yourself yeah so i've always looked for a way to avoid over technology because either it's costly or you've got to have the facilities like if you've got a some sort of electrical device you've got to have a plug to yeah. plug it into and usually the the uh, device is expensive so when i started to realize i really wanted to make objects more than flat work i got a saw and a bag of nails and a hammer and i scavenged boards from skips and demolition sites and yeah so That's one of the nothing. principles was it not costing anything. So if it didn't cost you anything, you're not precious about it. One of the stories I've heard, you didn't like the idea of a mortgage. You didn't want a mortgage. And obviously having to set yourself up in London after sort of being at, um, at art school wasn't, yeah. was kind of not something you wanted to do necessarily. It wasn't and so viable and the competition. And, you know, as I said, I stand with Bali, I'm socially inept. And um, I just couldn't see how I could go in a gallery and say, would you show my work or Yeah to compete because uh, there's so many there and i sort of in fact, actually this was born out when i went to a lecture by oldenburg who happened to say that so much happened in the 60s in art we can't expect that to happen each decade yeah and that we had to still digest what happened in the 60s in art mm. and he said we need to go to the country and sort it out but he meant that was just as a as a yeah, phrase of go course, to the yeah. <laughs> not physically step, take a step back but i had already literally. chosen to go to the country yeah, literally <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, but i just wanted to be able to be free enough and have enough time to make stuff and not to have because debt uh, because money was always a conversation at home and in the english middle class it was talking about mor mortgages <laughs> uh, and uh, I just thought this is a terrible weight around your neck. So I discovered while I was at college, when I on one of my trips up to North Wales, that my grandparents' place and where we stayed was down the valley. Yeah, which is, has a lot of rain. It's sixty inches, but just up the valley is Blindfastinio, with all the quarries, and that was regarded as being a bit of a dump. And it always rained because it has a hundred and twenty inches of rain. <laughs> right, <It's> the micro because <laughs> they. The prevailing westerly wind off the Irish Sea just lifts to 800 feet where it precipitates, where it becomes rain. Yeah. Every Atlantic cloud destination is blind of York, really. That's its <laughs> sort of target <laughs> where it dumps. Yeah. So that's why I got the property for so little money because nobody wanted to. Uh, yeah, you, you bought you bought two cottages, didn't you? Was it, it was two cottages. Yeah, well, yeah, what, one was a semi, which was livable in, which I. Yeah managed to get a, a local grant for and put a new roof on, put a bathroom in, in that. And then there was a sort of derelict detached house with a little bit of land, which is mostly yeah. a cliff, but with a little flat bit where there'd been a pigsty, yeah. which is where, where I built stuff there, in there. And I had a, a roof and an empty derelict rough studio, and I did odd jobs. This is 1966, this I think it was, is, is the actual... Yeah, I bought the place. I still had another year to do at college, so I was yeah. preparing to leave and go to Bliner for Stinyog. My idea was to be there for two years mm -hmm. at least to see whether I could really do this. Make it work. Or applying to a postgraduate. Because most of my colleagues, peers at college, they spent their entire third year talking about the applications they were making to, to do a, a yeah. postgraduate. And uh, they weren't focusing on their work. So I decided 
I wanted to just make a really good show at the end of my three years at Kingston. And I had somewhere to be, so I didn't have to worry about that. Yeah, I didn't have to worry about trying to get into a college because most of the time, they, you know, they didn't get in. So then they applied to the next place. And yeah. they waiting, waiting, talking about it, and then they didn't get in. So then they would fly to the next place. So to actually have yeah. done that at such a young age, to have had the sort of, you know, you must have been so strong-willed at that period, you know, and you must thank yourself. Well, you must look back and thank yourself. And partly say, the you. anger of realising what appalling <laughs> history of the English overseas, particularly in what they've done colonial, the opium wars in China. It's yeah. unbelievable that we were drug dealers. We were very active. We didn't allow opium to be used in Britain, but we were very happy for it to ruin China. Yeah. We even went to war to make them when they said, no, we don't want it any, anymore. Any, 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 anyway. You, so, so in so the when... anger and also my determination to be a free person, separated yeah. from this dreadful, what I felt English middle, middle class values. Because, yeah, an artist said something about it. the problem with the English middle class is they mistake thinking for values. Yeah, which if you, is something worth thinking about. That yeah, mistake. definitely mistaking value for thinking. You're thinking about well, how does this look to other people, or how do I value this, or how do I place myself in the values of other people? She's not thinking hmm. anyway. You made your first sort of sculpture there, didn't you? Um, at the at the studios or the, the two cottages that you bought, which was First yeah. Tower, I think it was called. Is that right? Is that the, is that the one? Yeah, yeah, it was a lunatic. <laughs> vicious. It was like trying to write a huge opera. How, how did that go with the locals, by the way? Um, <laughs> I was so naive, you know. I thought, I'm here, nobody's watching me no, was, you know, <laughs> I was so free from not being in art school when everybody's watching each other yeah and um there's a certain sort of passivity in the local people although they when i got to hear what they thought i was doing it was amazing anyway blew down twice uh that was before i got capital rue where i could now have a huge space i could make things like that in, inside and i also realized if you go somewhere People are looking, are looking at what you're doing. If you're saying that you're an artist, everyone has to take a view with each other. They, they might discuss it. Yeah. And it would be a very brave person to be positive mm -hmm. about what I was doing. But fortunately, I happened to meet two people, uh, who were very positive about what I was doing and were right. mentally help, helpful. One was a very elderly lady, Phyllis Plater, who had been partner to John Cooper Powers, who happened to live just down the hill from me and she could see my tower from her kitchen window so she got in touch with me and a friend of hers brought her up and we met and she was just a remarkable woman and she Fantastic. was was familiar with art you know she, she was a cultured she'd been in the literary world with john cooper powers for decades and then there was a i can only say a sort of an extremely extraordinary uh mystic uh fred Wynne jones who lived locally who Met him in a pub. Uh, he, he got me into conversation, and he asked the most really interesting questions. Yeah, and then he came to visit, and he and he actually, with my tower, he got it. Right, you know, he saw what the four stages were, and usually he was using language which I was familiar with in my head, but it was for oh, wow. Wow, because his, you know, he was a local. It was, uh, mother was Irish, father was Welsh. He was the youngest of ten, I think, and. Um, right. But he was a very, he is, he's still alive. He, I value him enorm enormously. And then we worked together in the f economic forestry group where we were doing part-time works. Right. Or digging ditches, planting trees, and spraying gorse with poison. <laughs> this, this, was in the, this was in the late 60s. And uh, it rained so much that we spent most of the time in his, in his car smoking roll up fags and talking philosophy <laughs> and it was like i was i was in a like a, a university with a master wow a, yeah <laughs> that's incredible i mean it's um you bought capital rue uh, obviously you, um after the, the cottages which you didn't have to, for too long but you bought capital rue in 68 uh and it yeah. was absolutely ridiculously cheap price of 300 pounds which i think you you bought it at auction didn't you is that right against another no, no it was it, it, somebody was it 200 pounds yeah, it's two hundred pounds. Two hundred pounds. 
I was tipped off by someone who knew I was looking for. Yeah. Somewhere. It was at the other end of town, and I was, you know, it frightened me really. But it was like, God, you know, I could actually afford this. It was all that I had. Right. And where the cottages were was the other end of town, and I had an amazing view. And we got what sun there was. We got all of it. Yeah. And got the sunsets. But it, it, where we, where I am now, where I'm speaking from, we're, we're in the shadow end. We do get sun, and my wife has made an amazing garden here. It's not what it was like, but it was just, I mean, it's amazing that Claire joined me here because it was so basic and primitive. We were on family income, income supplement. We were on a merely minimal income. Yeah. And we had our two boys here, went to the local school, and um, I was able to just keep on, keep working. Uh, I, I got part time lecturing in various art colleges because that. It, the economic world, the, the need to make a living actually does draw you into the social world. I found that I had to bite the bullet, or call it my stammer, I had, and I went into a college and I found I could do this. And I found I, could, I had a rapport, because I wasn't much older than the students, so I'm right. much clo- closer to them. Mm-hmm. And I'd been taught well, you know, and I also had Phyllis Plater and Fred Wynne Jones' <laughs> wisdom to be able to impart. So, and I, I did visiting lec- lecturing. I wasn't a part timer in anywhere other than for a few short periods. I, I was a visiting lecturer. So I'd go to the same college twice a term, another college once a term, and another place three times a term. So I, I had a little circuit, but I always had lots of time because it was paid very, very well, particularly for because our overheads were so low. Yeah. And my wife was prepared to put up with this minimal existence yeah that we were able to survive those first years and i you know i got shows people got interested yeah um but largely because there are a lot of part-time artists working in art colleges and that they got to see my work and hear and come to my slideshow and they would tell other people and gradually word got about until i got an invitation to show at the york music festival as a solo show which was really the beginning of it all in 1969, it was. You did a year, didn't you? You went back to school at uh, Chelsea School of Art, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, was it, yeah. 69, was... 70 for uh, 12 months. Yeah. For 12 months. The, 12 one, months. One thing that's interesting with regards to that, I don't know if you've heard you talk about it, but was a you had a te- was a teacher there? Was it George Fullard at that point? Was he there? Yes. Yes. I've always I find his work interesting. He, I have some some kind yeah. of links with his work. So what was he like? Was it what was George like? Well, for me, it was amazing because um, there were six of us. We yeah. all had little like a little cubicle mm-hmm. and there was a courtyard so i'd built my first tower yeah and then i wanted to build another tower but i wanted to be able to make it a lot better and they had three very good technicians who were very positive mm-hmm. uh, which is unusual because the technicians i've met at our school were not very helpful really uh but they these guys were were amazing and i because part of why i didn't want to go trying to get into a, a postgraduate yeah. place was to test myself and i was really hungry for this so i hit the ground running you know i went in i knew what i wanted and george fullard recognized this and he told the technicians give david whatever he wants right you know and they didn't interfere with me the staff were interested yeah and they would talk to me rather you know quite differently from what i was used to more 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 like an equal uh and I had a bike. I lived in Notting Hill in a flat, <laughs> on a ground floor flat, uh, which had been with an artist who was a, a great mentor for me while I was at Kingston. Eddie Pickett and his friend Jerry Pethick had moved out of this flat and other artists had, you know, there had been a succession of artists and I managed to get this. It was seven pounds a week, I think. Yeah. And I, another chap from Chelsea shared it with me, Notting Hill. I had a bike. It would take me just under half an hour to cycle to Chelsea Art, Art School. I get there for when they opened, which is 6.30 in the morning. Well, that, well, that was when the caretakers were, were there. They'd opened it up for me. And I was there till we had to go at 8. Wow. That's amazing. And I, there was a transport calf down down the King's Road. It's called the Transport Calf. Which you got a huge pile of food for not much. So that was really my main meal. <laughs> and uh, So I just worked there all the time. And I was... Flying, you know, I was so hungry for it. Yeah. And there were all these museums, you know, the V&A was very close. Yeah. Uh, exhibitions and concerts, lectures, 
Mm. You know, that's when I heard Klaus Al Oldenburg. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great year. When you were obviously back at, um, at, at Capel Roo then, what, you know, you're the actual work that you were producing in that time prior to what we will talk about briefly uh, in a moment. What was the kind of work like? How would you sort of describe the work? You were making well, was towers with the wooden colored, painting. Colored wooden constructions. I was putting color into space. Yeah. Initially, it didn't matter what it was made of. I painted it yellow, and I tried to sort of put it up there, and then nearby would be another shape made of something else in blue. And uh, yeah. so there were mainly primary colours, but it was just Caro would have been. Caro, yeah. There was an yeah. exhibition in '65, wasn't it? Is it the new? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's when I learned about sculpture is really about space, is our yeah. articulated space, and I hadn't yes. really physically realised that. And then, and then he used colours, but I thought he was using it in a much more profound way than he really was. <laughs> <laughs> he often asked his wife, apparently, what colour do you think I should paint it? <laughs> that wasn't well, really... I, I had a more metaphysical approach. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I, I was burning out with that. I, was, I sort of realised I was losing my, my way. And I, I like the wood, but I didn't know how to... Finish and end, really. Yeah, I tend to leave things when it seems to be sufficient, which I, which I still, which I do. But I wasn't sure about that. There's a lot of things I wasn't sure about. Yeah. And then I gave myself an exercise of addressing wood as what wood is, which is a tree. It's from a tree. So I, the nine crack balls was. Really that's yeah. That's what I was going to talk to you about. Could you tell us um, the story about nine crack balls, about how the origin of it, and, and... well. It, I was making all this colored stuff, these constructions yep. in this big, big chap. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I actually, all the work I made, I made three towers in the courtyard at Chelsea. So I got it through someone who I knew who had a trucking company, who his parents had a trucking company yep. based in North Wales. And they actually, for free, got all the material back up to Wales. So all that was into the chap. So it was all sort of dismantled. So I just reused it, recycled it. And I made this like based on an actual Gorky painting, and a great waterfall pouring down the end wall of Capel yeah. Rue in, 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 inside. So there was that. And then that was when I was feeling not sure and I was wanting to address wood. So I gave myself an exercise to get a piece of fresh wood. And uh, it so happened that they were cutting some ash trees opposite me in the field to make a plain field. It was like a bog. And I managed to buy for a pound this tree. Not very big. It was only about 12, 14 inches diameter. Yeah. Down with an axe. So one end had that sort of pointed shape form. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd cut it off with an axe where the crown was. It wasn't, you know, it's just a length of wood. And they, with a JCB, they just put it over the wall. And I rolled it across the road and in, 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 into my front yard. So I got a, I, 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 I had axes to cut firewood, yeah. split firewood. So I got my axe and I just f cut through it with an axe just after the end, just beyond the end. So I had another like V shaped cut. So you get this roundish, this yeah. roundish shape. Yeah. I've been looking at the slate tip and I love these huge tips of slate Fantastic. where all the waste slate is trundled out of the workshops on these carts on rails along a horizontal track. And then when they got to, to the end, where they could tip it, it's tipped. So that would come roll down the uh, hill a bit. And then they've been doing this for over a hundred years. Yeah. All around Bliner. The horizontal tipped full. So that was at an angle. So there were these shapes of basically an angle of uh, repose, which is where the, the bits of, say, so some of them are very big, just found themselves and they lodge, but they could only be got there along a flat horizontal. Yeah. So they had horizontal tops and then an angled end. And I realized these are not so self-consciously made objects, these slate yeah. tips. These are from a process. Yeah. So my exercise was to focus on the process of making. So there was wood. I made things with wood. And I used a metal edge to cut it with, which is often a saw. But and then an axe is a metal edge. So these are the basic materials and tools of what my material was my chosen material was and i wanted to learn more the language of wood i wanted to be able to speak wood and not just use it as a dumb stuff to put color on so i cut this object 
And one of the points of this exercise, I wasn't to touch it, the surface, because I'd be worried about filing and sandpapering and how much to do and all that sort of stuff. Just let the mark of the tool be the mark on the object. So this roundish lump came off, and I so I I just made another one and another one and another one until I got to the end. I had nine. So that was my exercise yeah. uh, of addressing wood. And I wasn't really seeing it as making up. So then I took these balls inside. Uh, I had them on the floor. And then I still had these other constructed things I was making. So I didn't really know where to go on. So I just went back to those other things. So the balls got moved to the side. Some plywood I was I bought arrived. I brought them in, leaned it on the wall, and the balls happened to be on the floor at the bottom of the wall. So they disappeared out of sight. Yeah. Then about three months later, I was going to use plywood, move the plywood, and the nine balls were there, but they'd cracked. Mm -hmm. All of them were cracked. They were like grinning at me. <laughs> and they were like, they were, I thought that was funny. Yeah. Really interesting because they had done something without me. Yeah. Being of course. Yeah. yeah. Because they're just dried and it's just a natural phenomenon of wood. As it dries out, it shrinks and inevitably has to crack. I later discovered each wood does that in a different, in a different way. I thought, yeah, this is interesting. This, yeah. <laughs> this is something. Yeah. Just an exercise. This is really something. And I, so that was really my first step. I'd done yeah. all this other work beforehand and I'd already started to get some teaching on the strength of that other work. You know, there, there was this, what seemed like a change, but it wasn't really. It was just getting back to basic. Yeah. And I that's where I've been ever since, really. I've just, yeah. and one, to make a journey, you put one foot in front of the other. So you don't worry about 30 steps on. And then sometimes you make a big leap with an idea. So you try that, but it's odd. It's an odd thing. You haven't done that before. Then the, you find you're filling in the gap between what you were doing and, then, and that next piece. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic time that but that you produced that work. And it was, like you say, it's a real touchstone moment in your career that I think um, that, that particular work. And that's why yeah. I, I love it. It's a real yeah. sort of, yeah. it's a piece um, that is, is so important, I think, as a work um, in, in your in your career. And obviously from that, you then, you were still finishing off other works that were these the painted works. You were sort of, you did this crossover, didn't you, period, I'm assuming, into yeah. sort of yeah. your, your work. It that took you a long time. Yeah. It took three or four years. So I started incorporating carved, rough carved objects in constructed shelving tables i was still combining bits of wood like yeah. i make a tripod so that's three elements and somehow the way of joining them in a non-carpentry way like hazel plaiting it which you can do with 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 a fresh hazel or putting oversized pegs through yeah. them you know, and leaving the pegs obviously you know, both ends showing so Everything about how it's made is there. Yep. So you can read it as an honestly made simple object. Yeah, at the time, I was finding myself much more drawn to museums of, like in Paris, the Musée Long, the Museum of Man. So there was a lot of ethnic work, mm. tables, you know, and those simple stairways made of a single trunk with steps cut out. They were actually feeding me more than art exhibitions although a lot of the things in art exhibitions were annoying me which was also very useful like <laughs> i love the philosophy of minimalism so there was a big minimalist sculpture show or show, show it wasn't a sculpture yeah and i loved what was written on on, on the wall but i didn't like the object because mm. it was all about simplicity of form and everything but huge complication in making them like a a stainless steel or a pure white cube made of metal. Yeah. Now that's a big technical feat. But I could do that assembling bits of rough wood. So I, I, I suppose, yes, yeah, somebody said my work was a sort of rural minimalism, which, I, which I'll take that on. Yeah, that sounds, that's fair enough. Early in the 70s, um, you acquired a plot of land, um, which was a kind, kind of coid. Um, yeah, kind of coid. Kind of coid. Um, could you tell us the sort of background of that? I mean, it's like a, an outside studio space is how I sort of envisage yeah. it. And uh, then in turn, after the, with regards to that, I don't know if it was around the same sort of time, but I think you did see an exhibition of uh, Richard Long and, um, and Hamish Fulton in seven, about 72 with regards yeah. to work to do with land art and thing. And yeah. I'm wondering if things sort of, you know, things have a way of combining to sort of lead you somewhere. Yeah. Perhaps, yeah. perhaps the fact that you had this plot of land and, and could you talk about that? And, um, 
Well, I was aware of the American land art, art artists. Yeah. And then there was a big art now or something like that at the Hayward Gallery um, in 72. And they had a Richard Long and Hamish Fulton work with there, among others, as Michael Craig and M M Martin. With. But there was a simplicity about their work compared to the American giant land art. Yeah. Which is American because America is a giant place. So if you go into the desert and you make a circle of stones, that's not quite the same as, well, when Michael Heiser gouges a gaff out of a cliff with a bulldozer. Yeah. You know, because that's an American scale. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But of course, Richard's done stuff all, 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 all over the world, even these stones. And then there's Hange Fulton who walks and photographs, but doesn't move yeah. in anything. Hmm. So uh, Roger Ackling, who simplified it even further by instead of having a camera lens, he just had a lens and he burnt any bits of wood he found on his walk with the light of the sun, if the sun was strong enough and there was enough of it, you would burn, burn lines. So that was even sim simpler. So th they were the artists who, you know, really interested me. It was something new. I didn't really get it to begin with. It took me a, a year or so to sort of understand what they were doing. Yeah. And I felt I was akin to it, although I am a maker of objects and their philosophy was much more pure in, in a way, I think. Um, like they don't like to be seen as a land artist. I mean, they won't take part in a show called Land Art because uh, they see themselves as artists. Um, oh, that, so, Kindly Coed, piece of woodland, it had been a husbanded land for several hundred years, feeding a, the local uh, timber yard where there was beech and oak, and this was for an estate uh, where they made all their own stuff. So they they had several areas which were wooded, and they and they and they grew wood for their own use. Yeah. But this state being broken up, it been sold on. Uh, somebody had bought it, and he had allowed a woodman to go into it. The idea was to take ten mat mature oaks out. The owner was away. The woodman turned out to be a rogue. He went and he took everything, and just oh. he took all the trunks. Yeah left anything straggly or wasn't worth anything, took the trunks and left all the brash. In the National Park, owner was in big trouble, you know, it wasn't what was intended. I just managed to get the job of clearing up. I just took a very long time over it. And yeah. I made sculpture there out, out of the fallen branches. And uh, I was clearing up, so I was piling a pile of beech and of branches and twigs and then a pile of oak. And then I thought, well, oh, you know, that was when I was beginning to, beginning to learn the differences between how a beech grow and how oak grow, how birch grows, and how elm grows. It gave me an opportunity to physically connect with the different species yeah. in a way that you can't get from reading books. Of course. Um, you, you did make work there, and one of the, well, one work that we'll talk about now, if that's okay, which was in, it was in 1977, uh, in, in the February, you planted 22 ash saplings uh, in a circle. And this is known as the uh, Ash Dome, which is yeah. one of my favourite works by yourself. Um, can you describe the work and what you wanted to sort of achieve from the, from the work itself? Um, I had questions about outdoor sculpture because most sc outdoor sculptures work, contemporary work, were in outdoor exhibitions. Big, yeah. You know, the nature of an exhibition is that it, it it's assembled mm -hmm. and it's on for a time. People look at it and then it's disassembled, and so it, it's rootless. They're often made in a studio, and uh, you could really, I could feel that. Because something you make inside, when you bring it outside, it's, it sort of diminishes. Because it might work inside in a neutralized space, but outside, you're making it in the active elements of space and time and wind and weather, and you're in, in a way working in, an, in, a, in a very alive environment. But if you make something outside and you bring it in, it actually grows. You bring the outside in. There was that. I also heard that the British Navy in, in Nelson's time, he actually did, because they were running out of oak, they had to use teak from India. Right. The Navy didn't like the way the teaks sat in the water. So its buoyancy wasn't the same. So it was decreed that this was happening in France as well, because they'd actually run out of oak. Uh, it was decreed that landowners were to plant oak for the fleet in the late 19th, early 20th century. Right. That long-term thinking is just amazing. The that's, idea that's, that's, in, that's incredible, that, because um, 
with regards to the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, they're, they're, um, they're having to, they're, they're rebuilding, obviously, the, yeah, yeah. The, spi the spire at the moment, and they're cutting yeah. down like a thousand oak or something. A lot of these were planted yeah. perhaps for this purpose or for certainly per but, but a couple of hundred years ago, you know, which is, which is interesting. Yeah, there was a, a, there's a college in Cambridge that um, in their hall, there's a 40 foot long beams, oak beams, and they got Death Watch beetle in it. So they were, where the hell are we going to get these beams from? And then they, they someone reminded them they've actually got them on land <laughs> and they've been grown for this purpose. For this purpose, yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, so oaks don't grow naturally, they don't grow straight. They, they, it is a bush tree. Right. It's a bush. It's, it's crown would normally be, be low. They have to be husbanded. They have to oh, be right, okay. the side sheets are trimmed off and they're, they're, they're grown quite close or, or, or with other trees to make them compete. So they have to go up. And then another thing I heard was that the Chinese potters of the famous Tang and other dynasties in that they were potter families. So the potters were always using the clay their grandfather laid down for them, the digger pit, and that this large amount of clay was put in there to settle. So that was their their material. Yeah. So they were obliged to lay down a pit of clay for their grandchildren. Right. So and I well, I'm using wood. Um, so I need to be planting to replace the wood that I'm using. So that was another instigation. So also part of my deal was with clearing up was I would replant. I wanted to plant deciduous trees, and having had my experience of planting trees. In the forestry, which you in straight lines, I didn't want to plant them in straight lines. So then I planted one tree and a second tree. Where would you put the third tree if you don't want to make a line? So if you triangulate, then you and you're thinking about this tree getting bigger. So you need to think about the distance between them, and then there's a space. Yeah. So you make there's a space. Uh, also, the, another question was, how do you have an outside sculpture which can relate to the season? can be genuinely of its place well obviously a planted tree yeah is exactly that so uh there was one flat area on this sloping four and a half acres of kind coed which was clear and it was big enough for a, like a 30 foot diameter ring of trees um and i researched in the hedges because that's where farmers they lay trees down and then they yeah. keep the hedge what was the most resilient trees there and it was the ash ash trees are very different from oak oak are very sensitive they're sensitive to how much light they get they're quite a fragile tree and the other thing about land art i'd noticed my only criticism my sort of hesitancy about it was so i'm going to go into a countryside area a rural area an outback area what you know really genuinely wild area and move something yeah and make an intervention and then they'd leave it and the record of it was the art, or the, the concept of it was the art, that had to be presented in some way by photograph or by text or by drawing. And it occurred to me with, with this idea that I was thinking of, it, is that I would need to stay there. I would need, if I was going to do this, and I was going to commit to growing a dome, then it would take me 30 years, probably about 30 years. Yeah. And I would need to be there. I need to stay with it. So it was an artist-connected work, or a person-connected work. An artwork that needed the creator to stay with it, not move on and do, a, do yeah. something somewhere else. So all these things combined. The other thing about the Chinese potters, um, I think it's in the Tao Te Ching, is that the potter holds a, a volume of space, an aesthetic volume of space in his mind, and he brings the clay up around that space. So he's making an, a like he's surrounding a nothing. Yeah. It, it's all to do with something and nothing, yin and yang. So I just love this idea of the growing trees to spiral and sort of grow over a domed-ish space. I had to learn a lot quite fast yeah. about how to bend them, how to, how to graft branches on. Um, but once I got the form established, it was really just pruning. I had to choose when and what to prune to actually yeah. grow. But they were each tree, although it's roughly doing the same thing as its neighbours, they're all quite individual, so they're like in a wild sort of whirling dance. 
Yeah, that's that, that's exactly. They do look like um, they do like like a dance, don't they? They just that's yeah, just the yeah. way they formed. They formed um, like these, you know, the Matisse painting dance or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's, yes, that, a lot of people have. have is this, oh, they said that right? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I mean, what greater work? Could I, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true, and it is something that you've tended for for such a for such a long period of time. And and what I one thing about the work that ma- makes me respond to it is that to have a work as powerful as, as Ash Dome and Wooden Boulder, which we'll talk about um, shortly, is that so few people have seen these works, and yet it's, it's a different... Like, how, do people, how do people have this experience of them without actually being able to see? It's just this incredible connection. Well, well, that, well another aspect of the Ash Dome is in the 70s, there was conceptual art, and I, yeah. and I, I, really, I really got that, the concept, yeah. uh-huh. an idea, is really what's behind it. It's more to do with the with the truth of the human being being able to think of something and well an idea for this yeah. thing of what an idea is and how to communicate that and there are many many ways of doing it other than making a beautiful object um so there was a concept and an aspect i noticed about conceptual art is almost an, an opposite of what you'd imagine is that it's totally dependent on in a way the word of mouth is the story of the idea yeah people to communicate to each other when I was going to art colleges and talking with the other staff and the students, you'd talk about an idea, about a concept. And um, well, there was a lot of conceptual work going on in art schools then. And uh, well, often it was down in the pub talking about the idea and then it's exciting. And then they go and do it. And it was like, uh, and then <laughs> so, did that really work? And then you go back to the pub and talk about it. It's all exciting again. Yeah. The, the idea, the idea is exciting. Yeah. That's it. So a lot of this, is it doesn't really need to be seen. Um, yeah. And I sort of, also word of mouth, I know is very, very powerful, or, I, or I've become to realize word of mouth yeah. and how s- stories about artworks are passed on. So the Ash Dome, well, that, what's amazing is that um, it's now on, regularly on BBC4 as a, as a space between programs. Yeah. And there, 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 are, there, are, there are four things. There's a stove that's uh, looking down on James Terrell's piece at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park yeah. stove and it divides into four which initially annoyed me but and there's the Ashton <laughs> and there's and I think there's what there, there is no. one other yeah but somebody actually found the Ash Dome. Yeah, because it is a secret sort of location, isn't it, really? Well, I don't make it public. I mean, you don't make it, which is fair enough, of course. Yeah. A lot of people know where it is, but you yes. know, if you make something public, then you're going to get a big footfall. Yes. And, I, and I've, I've made work in, uh, there was one in France, which was like a moss project involving charred wood, and moss grows on charred wood, and it needs a shade. Right. For moss needs shade. It doesn't grow in the open. But so many people have gone there that they've killed all the moss. <laughs> Right. And uh, of course, so many people were going there. They opened up, they thinned the trees. So there's no shade. So. Yeah. There's a spiral of rotten oak, which should have been a totally green. No, uh, it didn't matter if it was rotten wood because the moss would have continued growing. And the moss was the point of it. Yes. So that's from over footfall. Yeah. So, that's you know, I just have to be careful because, you know, people tread on stuff. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. If you're not aware of. But, but but like you say, I think um, I heard you say that it's probably about been about a thousand people who've probably seen it, but so many more people actually know of its existence. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, the, the nightmare. I mean, I don't. It's a nightmare for me. But you've accepted it in a different way. Is obviously the the issue of of the ash die back with, yeah. with the work themselves, which is which is um, it's kind of sad to me, obviously. Um, but yeah. it's part of its existence. It's part of its life. It'll go back into the earth, which is I know is kind of important to you, and so. You've, have you planted another ring around it or something, of oak or something? Yeah, I've tried an oak. I've always thought the ash dome needed to be about another metre right. bigger. In okay. Diameter, or in radial, you know, a two metre bigger. Well, with the ash dieback, I first came aware of it in 2012 when it was beginning to be publicly aware. that We didn't have much of it in Britain then. Uh, and I had a big show at Kew Gardens, which involved my involvement at Kew for 12 months. And I, I had access to the scientists there, you know, and they were, and they were very helpful. And in the fungi department, they, I, I was shown it, the actual spores and, wow. and the, and the fungus. Yeah. There wasn't much knowledge about it then. But what was realized is that this tree, the you know, younger trees, uh, are much more vulnerable yeah. as particularly in rural areas. 
It's less prevalent in urban areas, apparently. Um, so it was likely. So I did research and find out what people were trying to do. Uh, one of the advices was that you collect all the leaves which come off any ash leaves around and you burn them. But that's like a full-time occupation. Of course. You know, and uh, nifting the trees with compost. Charcoal was yeah. could be air spaded in. So I was really researching what I had to do and I realized that actually a lot of these things, we hadn't started them early enough. The tree doesn't gain its strength and immunity by just one dose in one year. You've got to go work at it for years. And part of the ash dome idea is it's semi-wild. It's not topiary. I mean, uh, so if you know, it's a very bad piece of topiary. If it's topiary, <laughs> I just did it as and when it seemed to need something cut off or something grafted, or but it needed to be semi to see semi wild. So there's a presence of the human being. It wouldn't be grown like that without without the human being. But the trees were the, were still viable trees. Yeah. Uh, so earlier, I just realised that I had to accept because it might the old concept was that the form this form of space would mature out of the ground, out of the natural forces of that space. So if a calamity, natural calamity like ash dieback is present, that is a, a natural natural phenomenon. Yeah, of course. So I really, I, if I went back to the concept, then really I had to accept that rather than this sort of preciousness. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've been criticized for not, some somebody was, <laughs> was very angry about me not, but she was telling me all about this char, and she had a lot of it, and how I had to do this to do that. And I said, "Well, yeah. I know I'm not doing it, but the concept can can uh, live on." So I'm trying out, but then I do know oak are a lot more fragile, and they don't, they're not really getting enough light. We've done a lot of pruning around the area. Yeah, the oaks on the north side are not getting enough light really, because um, ash is a very vigorous light-seeking tree. Okay, uh, and it it can be very linear whereas oak is not naturally linear, as I said. But I have done some experiments with young oak where I've cut lead growth off and, and the branch has taken up the uh, lead growth. Mm -hmm. Also, that was how I was pruning the ash dome, is that I was taking off lead growth, so a, a branch would then take up lead growth, but it would be at an angle. Right, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic work, and like I say, it's one of my um, favourite uh, pieces yeah. of art, I think. How, how but redoing, reinvigorating yeah. the idea with oak. Yeah. Somebody has to be there to do it. They're much slower. Of course. Uh, yeah, so yeah, my, imagine. My, my son and his son, my grandson, they were there when, when we planted them. And then my main assistant, Sam Plate. And uh, he's also very keen on the ash dome. And he was there with uh, his children to plant them. So he got. That is lovely. He, That's really three lovely. Three generations. They were there. Well with, done. Uh, there was me <laughs> and a friend of mine, yeah. who's also a plants person, as representing yeah. our generation. And then there was. Sam and Jack, and then there was... That's lovely. That's a, I love that idea. Edward, uh, Elsbeth, and Kieran, and Elodie were, were there. So, you know, that is sort of like trying to plant the idea of you see if you can keep this going. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so thank you for talking about Ash Dome. It's an amazing um, piece, and people can see images of it, and I'll, I'll post some images as well. We'll move on now uh, to uh, another <laughs> big, uh, big, um, yeah, big yeah. piece of that you are well known for, which is a wooden boulder, which was in 1978, yeah. which is the year after, which is the same year as the uh, as the initial Grisdale um, residency. I think late 70s. Well, you know, we maybe discuss it. Obviously, it was a, a very um, yeah, were very busy, time, busy time, yeah. busy time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. busy time. Yeah. But wooden boulder, um, which is a another incredible piece of this. This again, it's like how can a, a piece move you so much by just watching a film of it it's like it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible you know it's like watching it's like watching rocky or something you know <laughs> <laughs> the, people do emotionally invest in it they do they do so i'll just describe the piece it's um i mean basically you wanted to create um an oak sort of sphere um i believe w um, and see what it, what would happen with it when it would dry out which is like what you what were nine cracks balls and you would see yeah. how a larger sort of piece would react to it could you describe what actually happened then? So it was a piece that you were, it was a fallen tree, wasn't it? An oak tree. Um, and you went to the yeah, site. Yeah, well, uh, I had the Grisdale experience. Yeah. And the Grisdale, the, the material on offer there were any fallen oaks or any fallen trees. Yeah. And they'd done some thinning in Grisdale of oaks. And when you thin, you actually disturb the, air, the natural aerodynamics, which groups of trees develop together. So a lot of trees suddenly very vulnerable, and they had two big gales, 
which knocked a lot of oaks down. Yeah. So there were a lot of fallen oak. So I could take my uh, pick up then. So this is the first time I had such an abundance of wood. Just after Grivedale, this big oak up on the foothills of, of the Molwyn Mountains here, which is by a footpath in the National Park, yep. lost a huge limb. And it was growing on a very rocky area, so its roots couldn't be very deep. So the tree was out of balance, and it was by a footpath, so it was deemed to be dangerous by the, by the National Park. Yeah. I got to hear about it, and I managed to get the job of taking it down and clearing it up. Uh, so it had to be cut down. Unfortunately, but now I had a really big oak tree for the first time in, in Wales. It's only 10 minutes by car. And before I went to Grisdale in the previous year, 77, I'd done a lot of work with hazel, thin hazel rods, fresh, yeah. platting them. And I wanted to get I wanted to get into volume. Here I had some volume and I, nine crack balls were still very present. Mm -hmm. uh, first stepping stone. And so I wanted just to make a big one. So uh, I started cutting it with an axe, but I actually started using a chainsaw by then. And I realized that actually the marks of the axe were very, to the volume, it was all too small. I wouldn't be able to roll the tree anyway, because it was tons of wood. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You had to cut all the way around with an axe. So I did it with that. So I, they were like, it was faceted. And I made it as big as I could. And there were, so there were natural fissures in it. You know, there were gaps. Yeah. Um, like when I've often, when I've made a cube sphere pyramid, the pyramid is bigger than the than than the wood can contain, but there are enough angles and enough just enough volume that the bits which are missing sort of add in. You know, it does it works. It's still a pyramid. Yeah. So with this roundish ball, and my idea was to get it back to the chapel and let it dry out. But how to get it back? And uh, we were quite high up. It's a long track down to the road. I didn't know anyone who had a truck big enough. So yeah, I realised that. One way of getting it down safely and interestingly was to get it, work it down the stream, which was running just beside me. So now there was a, like a, a, a waterfall, a series of waterfalls down, down this rock slide. And we, we and colleagues, we rolled it to, to that point. And I had a photographer ready to photograph the splash. Yeah. So I, my idea as a kind of concept, you have this big ball in, in, in a gallery. This big lump of wood, cracked yeah. or, or or whatever, and then next to it was a huge black and white fit picture of a splash. Yeah. And you wouldn't see the ball, this lump of wood in the splash, but you could just associate. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The two things. So uh, anyway, the bit of wood, this lump got stuck halfway down the waterfall, so it, <laughs> we, we never got a photograph. <laughs> and there's no way that I could move it. It was too it's too slippery and dangerous, and so I just. Except the fact that it was there and uh, the water was running around it, and I just shrugged my shoulders and said, "Right, I'll get on with the next bit of wood." Yeah. So I was going up there regularly, passing this piece of wood, which I would see from from the path going up. It would just change. I mean, immediately it went to like a very, very deep indigo color because the iron in the water was reacting with the tannin in the oak. So, and that tannin and iron just makes this color. Um, so that was amazing because it was when I when I put it in, it was this sort of golden, warm color of yeah. freshly cut oak, and then within a couple of weeks, it was almost black. Then um, autumn was happening, and leaves were piling up behind it, and then there'd be a big rainstorm, and all the leaves would be washed away, and then um, we got into the spring. Oh, no, further into the winter, it got really cold. There was ice on it, and then there was snow on it. So every time I went up, I realized this is really interesting. Got the ball, this rough. Ball is stays the same, but it's it's continually changing. The circumstances around it are changing. So it's yeah. like a, a football in a football game is that the ball doesn't change, but what's happening around it is what what's exciting. Yeah, true. The other thing about wooden bowler uh, in March it got washed down by a big storm. So now it was in a pool and uh, quite deep. When you have a sphere of wood in water. It's mostly, un it's like an iceberg. There's very little above it. It's like a hippopotamus head. You know, you just see, yeah. the, you see the top <laughs> of it. Well, you know, I wanted to get it still on its journey. And so I've been photographing the ball in this waterfall, halfway down the waterfall. And now it was in another place. Uh, well, uh, this is this is really interesting. You know, this is the next stage. So the next stage was to pull it out. So I made a net out of ropes, 
netted it, winched it out with my block and tackle. And uh, so it was on this side. So the next rolling, I could, I could get a, possibly get an, you know, I could get a photograph of it. And somebody helping me said, you'll, you'll, you'll be filming this. So it so happened that someone had just moved up to the area. He's a student at the Royal College in the nice. film school. She had a 16 mil Bolax. Was interested to uh, help me, so she came to start filming it. So uh, we we got it on the side. And then some kids must have come by because when I went again, the boulder was back in in the, oh, in right. the pool. <laughs> so, you know, a round thing. Yeah, rolls, push. That's, temp- that's too tempting. That's too tempting. Well, it's nature, isn't it? It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the opportunity was to film it, pulling it out, which I didn't include in the film because it because I didn't want any any spoken word. It yeah. could be too difficult to to to, to actually explain. Uh, and then I left it in the shallows. I, I pushed it to where kids couldn't, and I watched it again. And then eventually we pushed it down into the next pool. So that was film. Yeah. So around about eighty three, I had enough film of it in different seasons, and with photographs of the earlier part slide, we could make a little film. So you know, I got the money from the Welsh Arts Council, and they helped me make a five six minute film. Progress so far. Yeah, and I I filmed where it was going to go before it was there, so that little film ended with that bit edited in. Yeah, so it, you know you got the idea that it's gone because I knew it would get washed down further. But it took twenty five years for it. Twenty five years, to, it's incredible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was stuck under a bridge, and I had yeah. to get it out because I'd made a rule of not interfering with it unless it was going to cause a danger. Of course, because yeah. it, it, it's not in a wild area. We, where it's this is in a in a in a rural occupied area. So there's farmers, yeah. you know, and the local authority they they have to check under the bridges regularly, and if, if anything's stuck in there, they have they have to pull it out. Yeah, it's only a little 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 Grover's Road bridge, but uh, yeah, not the lo- local farmer who was very tolerant of my <laughs> of my <laughs> this thing. <laughs> uh, when it was stuck under the bridge, and he had told me, he said, you have to get it out of there because the local authority will be here. The local river boys, he called them, will be here and, and they will take it out. Yeah. And also, if you leave it in there, other stuff is going to, this is why they take it out, because more stuff gets lodged. On, and then it'll take the bridge out when there's a big storm and it'll all go into my field. Yeah. So, you know, so straight away we, we sort of got it out of there. And then I had the choice of what to do with it. I got it to the road. Do I take it up to the chapel and go back to the original idea? Because by that time, I decided it belonged in the stream. Yeah. And I was now the observer. But this was an opportunity to go back to the original idea. It jumped over a waterfall where I thought it would look amazing at, at the foot of this. So the opportunity, I thought, well, I could take it back there. Or I could roll it down the road through the gate and put it back in, in, in the stream the to go into the main river eventually. Yeah. And maybe they're not out to sea. So I asked the boulder what to do, and it was very clear that um, <laughs> going back up the stream was geographically immoral. <laughs> going back to the studio, like, end of story. Yeah. And, uh, yes, let's get to the sea. Fantastic. So, and then it took eight years before oh, it gosh. stayed in this, because <laughs> when a water's in a stream with steep sides, the force of water is very focused, but when it got out under under the bridge, the the stream, the banks were very shallow, so the water just dispersed, water power dispersed. Yeah. For two years, it had a, a barbed wire fence wrapped around it that had come come down the stream. So right. then I it looked awful, but I didn't do I didn't move it, but eventually it got it moved. I mean, somebody might have taken it off. Yes, yes. Or a big storm might right. have might have moved, and then it was gone. Yeah, then it was. Then it went for about five kilometers, and was then in. It was tidal, yeah. and now suddenly it was. It was connected to the moon yeah. in the tide, so which was lifting it, and either the incoming tide bring it back up the stream, up the river, but till the water level started to go down, and it would dump it, mm-hmm. and then the next incoming tide high enough lift it up and take it out. So it was going up and down every two weeks. It was in a different place, and then. Disappeared. So that's yeah. when I made the film. Yeah, that was, and, was it about uh, 2003, I think it disappeared, I think. And then you thought it had gone to the sea, I think, wasn't it? I think that's what. Yes, well, I, I made the film alluding it that it had gone to the, to the sea. Yeah. And I even got an oceanographer 
at Bangor University had a student who had done a, a database on the tides of right. of Cardigan Bay. Mm-hmm. So he said, if you give me the date of when it was last seen, we could work out in which direction it, the currents <laughs> Right. Were. But anyway, uh, 10 years later, it was suddenly back in which view. Is- it's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. It just appeared. Yeah. Was it? I think 2015. Oh, no. Sorry, it was before then. 2008. 2000, well, 2008, there was a brief appearance of it. So it appeared not to have gone out to sea. Right. Which I didn't really tell anybody about because I'd made this film and I'd made it <laughs> that was going out, out to sea. But um, then it was beginning to be washed. Then the, it seemed to get buried again. And I thought, well, that's it, really. Yeah. So five years later, in 2013, in August, it suddenly appeared, and it, it stayed pretty much in the same place for those two uh, years, covered twice twice a day. So either it was stuck in the mud or it was waterlogged. Yeah, because it did roll a couple of times, um, and it was in a it was in the lee of a little island. So the the flood water coming down from heavy rain, the force was divided by this island. So it was in this little calm air area, and then a big tide come coming in again. The force was mm. dissipated by this little island, and so um, by this time we had much better access to HD cameras, etc. So, yeah, that's it. The so world has they, changed in the time it's been in the yes. water. <laughs> yeah, so the uh, the film is also an archive of um, yeah. changing technology. That's amazing. Yeah, you don't think of that. That's brilliant. And then, and then eventually, it, it, was it 2015 the last time it was seen? Then, yeah, the same, the same tide. Yeah, two years later, the August tide, and it might have been somebody said that a big tree had come down higher up and was being swept down the river. That might have hooked it. Right. Okay. And then we've had a, a time when it's been really cold and there's been very little water, a yeah. little rain. Yeah. So usually the, the river water is quite brown. Like beer, really, yeah, because it comes from the peat bogs, so it's got the stain of brown. But if it's very cold, it doesn't have the stain in it. Mm. And also, if it hasn't rained much and it's a low tide, you know, you you can see in. Mm. And I thought it had just rolled into a deep area, but I was able to to poke around and look in all the possible yeah, yeah. nearby mm. places. But there was there was nothing there. But the amazing amount of tires, car tires. <laughs> <laughs> In the bottom, yeah, a lot of slate, so it's not all sludge. Yeah, a lot of big slabs of slate. It's it's an incredible thing. In 2015, like you said, last time it was sort of seen, and yet yeah. six years later, it's still in people's minds and it's still there. The con- yeah, well, like, it, so that you know, it's, it's just it's, it's somewhere. It is somewhere. It's somewhere. It's not lost. It's have you ever cons- have you ever considered putting a tracker on it next time? Yeah, but that would be. <laughs> It would be a scientific experiment. <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would suddenly it would be owned. Yeah. Because the other thing about it is it's not owned. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I'm I'm its narrative. I'm yeah. its story. I have the story. Yeah, that's true. And, that's um, true. One I... more thing about it related to the Ash Dome. Okay. This was done a year after the Ash Dome. That's right. And it wasn't conscious, this aspect of it. But the Ash Dome is a very hands-on piece. Yeah. And the wooden bowl became a very hands-off piece. Yes. Now, the, the Ash Dome is about trees coming. Yes. And wooden boulders about trees going. Yeah. So there's this like yin yang relationship between these two pieces. From those twenty five years they were they were opposite each other. On, yeah. One was on the north side of the Pali and the Ashton was on the south side. Yeah, it's um incredible incredible pieces. Um and so now we'll we'll move on to um so Grisdale then, if that's okay, yeah. which was um, which was obviously, like you say, it was before um, Wooden Boulder, but you know, we'll talk about it now. Yeah, but, and, and, and also after Ashdom. Yeah, and but after Ashdom, yeah. So I know it's so it's obviously uh, in the late seventies. It's an incredibly important period for you. I think your second son was born in seventy seven. You had an, an exhibition at the Arnold Feeney in Bristol. Um, Ashdom obviously planted in seventy seven. Um, you had a fletched over Ash exhibition in seventy eight in London, Chester, and Cardiff. You had your first overseas project as well in Yugoslavia, which was yeah. supported by the British Council in 78. And obviously, Wooden Boulder was in 78 as well. So, Grisdale Forest was um, a three-month residency. What were the origins of that? How did that sort of materialise as, as something? Um, there had been an art, artist placement group, APG, mm-hmm. by a London artists, and they'd managed to get residences in, in industrial situations. Yeah. Because a lot of them were making things in steel and... Arts Council were very keen then on 
getting the arts to be more accessible and more social, more, uh, you know, because they, they're a public body. It's public funding. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to sort of de-elite it in, in a way. They wanted to get it out more people. So this was part of that that idea. And then it occurred to somebody that um, an artist like myself, it wouldn't really be appropriate to put me into a factory. Uh, but what about a woodland? I think it was Alistair Warman whose idea it was, and Northern Arts were keen. There was a, a particular forest, Grisdale Forest, which had the theatre in the forest, initiated by Bill Grant, who was the uh, head forester there. Yeah. So this was a perfect, it was already set up, really, uh, in terms of public access, and they had the great Silurian way. So it was advertised, and I applied, I got interviewed, and then I was asked to be one of the first. I was actually, Richard Harris was there before me. The circumstances weren't good for for him. And um, so he came back later and yes, did some I'm... very, very good pieces. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the, the idea was to put work on the Silurian world, to work on the Silurian way, so people, again, this public access. Yeah. So people could see an artist working and then talk to them. But that became impossible because while well, I was using a chainsaw and you don't know if somebody's immediately yeah. behind you and a hundred thousand people walking there every year so you are talking <laughs> all the time. So I worked off the Silurian way and I put work on the Silurian way. So that was one aspect. Another aspect was that he hadn't got off to a very good start this and uh, the the workforce, there must have been about twenty forest workers there, were very scathing and skeptical, mocking, I guess. And um, so I realized I, I had to try to change this round. So I, I parked my car where they assembled in the morning, and I would be going to work loading my car with the saws and going to work when they were going to work at 7 in the morning. Yeah. I think it was 7, 7, 7 7.30. And then when they were coming out of the forest at 4, they could still hear me work. Mm -hmm. So that was like making a statement about that. And of course, with a chainsaw, you know, if somebody's, <laughs> you, hear, you can hear the awful, yeah. awful sound of a chainsaw. Um, now also, uh, I wanted to make something very accessible and I'd already made a small running table. Yeah. Before I went to Grisdale and I wanted to make a big one and they, they, this, the wood was perfect for it. And within, I think, three weeks, I'd got this piece made and I put it up and because they've got deer, big red deer. You know, they're seen in the, in the yes, forest yeah. and they got picnic tables so this idea of a running table was sort of it sort of connected yeah i, I love that piece it's, it's a large piece it's, it's a lot larger than what you think isn't it? it's quite a yeah. big i have seen a, i've seen obviously photographs it isn't there now but but the uh, the running table i believe was the first work in the park because obviously yeah. like you say yeah. you were the second residency there but richard hamilton he put his work in after that had, had already gone up because you did it quite quickly like you said running table yeah. in 78 as the first sort of work there which is quite interesting and you did mention then about um about some of the response to to the workers and you, not winning them round if you like but you certainly did win them round um you know some of the, the staff there there's a book called the sense of place which was sculpture in the landscape which refers to to this sort of and this is dr stephanie brown writes that due to the fact um, that grisdale was a working forest and the quote is the pressure to work hard and consistently is probably greater in a residency situation which works fixed hours David Nash experienced this as one of the first sculptors at Grisdale when he, he felt he had to impress the less enthusiastic of the foresters and workforce and convince them of the validity of his presence. One way of doing this through a self-imposed routine of exacting labour. So in the respect of the workforce, I started work every day at 7.45am and worked on long after they had finished. I, I love that. And then um, the other quote is from, from, like you say, the chief forester, which was Bill Grant's. And this was his memory of um, of your time in the forest. And he, he, this, I love this quote. It's brilliant, this. And it says, David, a born communicator, rapidly broke down the local opposition and demonstrated in a spectacular way that sculptors are not only creative, but damned hardworking people with integrity, vision and engaging skills in the use of natural forest materials. Glance, I love this now. Glancing out of my window at 8 a.m. one morning, I was amazed to see David driving past in his Morris Minor with a huge 30 foot long tree strapped to the top. <laughs> the, sort of, the sort of thing which we would normally use a timber wagon. I can just, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before, actually. But yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I know what he was referring to. Because the next piece I made was this big tripod. Because I'd made some tripods before, but this was a chance to do a, a make a, a really big one. So it was yes. a 
single long, slightly bent oak, which I split into three parts. Yes. The, 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 the horns were a branch which went off at the top, which I, which then was split. Yes. And so, so there were two parts of that. And then there was a third part, uh, all from the same tree. And then I, I wrote the top and I can't remember how we got that up. But anyway, it was, <laughs> very, it was 25 foot or something. And it was up, it was against the bright sky at, at a long vista going yes. up towards it. So it was a real sort of landmark. Yeah. I ought to say at this point before we go on that, um, yes. there was a lot of opposition. And, uh, I think two years later, um, some, People with chainsaws cut the running table and the tripod oh. up. Oh, good grief! One uh, one uh, night, so I, Peter Davis, head of the Northern Arts, he phoned me up and said, I've "Got some bad news." And uh, I called them radical ramblers because <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people go for a walk and they don't want to see art. They are expecting oh, to see art <laughs> or something they're not familiar with, so they're, they're annoyed by it. So. Yeah. Hence the radical ramblers. That's and brilliant. I love that. <laughs> but I, I went back in a winter of 81 and I made a second running table. And um, the ends of the branches I used for the legs, which met the ground, were mostly sapwood. And that they rotted out. So that had to come out after a couple of years. Yeah. It wasn't safe. And in 86, I went back and I made a much bigger one. Right. I was more skilled then. And I, I think that sort of had a similar fate. But, um, it's not there now. But anyway... The, What's made in the forest with wood can't be seen as are they going to be permanent works. And yes. Something You've that accepted that. Forest. That's part of you, isn't it? You've accepted yeah, that. You that's know, part, of the, that's they, part of the cycle need, of nature. They need to go. They need when to they're go. dead, yeah. they need to go. And um, there is a similar project in uh, where, how it started out in northern France, uh, northern Italy, artists sell it, which all the work is made in a riverbed, you know, in a, and it's a, so when the melting snow, it's a raging stream. Yes. At the time of the residency, there's no water, there's no water there at all, or hardly a trickle. Mm -hmm. So all the work is made there in the stream. And then in the winter, it'll be washed away. Yeah. So the, so the next lot of artists who came back, they, they then had a clean slate. Right. Start again. But then people started to make things and then put them off on the bank. And then yeah. sure enough, two or three years later, they're dead. You know, they just look, they look forlorn and. Yeah, yeah. Starting to fall to bits and they're not moved. They need to be moved. So things, yeah. I mean, some of the other work you produced there, I mean, it's, I think there was, there was a, there was at least eight that I've, I've sort of read about. Um, yeah. the, I think, I don't know how many are still in, uh, survive, if you like, but one that <laughs> definitely, wooden waterway, I think survives, doesn't it? To some, to some extent. Well, it survived for 10 years. It, that was the last thing I made. Right. And that was from the experience of one of the things that my family, well, my wife and I and our little kids were going to be looking forward to was to be out of the rain in Blinder. But we didn't know that Grisdale is the second. <laughs> so we started in February because I wanted to be in the forest coming out of winter into spring. I really wanted to, to experience that and be there for three months. So we stayed in the forest for three, for three months. We went yep. to Windermere, obviously, and Hawkshead, but we were, we just stayed local so the ground was really really wet uh well, every day i went to work i was trudging through wet ground and um then the spring came it was still raining a lot but the ground dried up and i realized it's all gone up into the trees now you can you can read that in a book but to actually physically experience this yeah change in the ground quality you know but actually drying out although it was still raining the volume of water that is going up into the trees as they started to, to work when the spring started was, and I just wanted, I became aware of this water and wood connection. So I wanted to make something that, that's a connected water and wood and the wooden waterway was the result of that. So there were, there was a, there's the Silurian way yeah. and there was a little stream which ran under the Silurian way in a pipe. It came out and near there, there was a fallen oak, which was lying with its trunk down a slope. And then just below that, there was a, I think a sycamore fallen. So the root plate was up yeah. in both trees and they were both lying down. So I thought I could, I could run the water with a trough. I could run the water through the roots of the oak. Down, if I cut a trough, it would run down there and then I could take it off the oak and run it in a trough into the beach. Yeah. 
through the roots of the beach, through the back of the of this root plate, and down the beach. And then well, that's where I started. And it took about two weeks to make, I should think. Right. And uh, I thought it lasted about six weeks. But this is something which it gave the public of the 100,000 people walking alongside her in way. Enough of them, particularly families with young kids who, who spotted it. Yeah. Because it wasn't that visible, but if they spotted it and they worked out what it was and it wasn't working, the leaf had got stuck in it or, and the water was pouring off, they would figure that out. Or if one of the connecting sluices, which were made of branches, if that had slipped out, yeah. uh, they would put it back in and prop it up. And so it started to change. And then when, some, when one of the sluices broke, somebody made a new one. They went off at, at least 10 years. It was right. still running. Yeah, That's incredible. No, I, 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 I did see somewhere a post not that long ago that it is sort of still, somebody got it reworking again. I think, I mean, it's incredible. Not even that long ago. So it's incredible. Well, the yeah. idea is that when I, I'm having a show, in the Grisdale. Yes. I mean, it's, so, it's changed so much up there. The theatre in the forest is, is no longer there, but, but they have a proper centre there and a proper cafe. Yeah. There's nothing like that before. The, the, the courtyard, which is where the workers assembled, kept their tools. And then there was an, an office block where the office places, like yes. all stables really being converted, which is where the, where the executive work. And then the, across the little stream, there was a wood mill, which was a functioning wood yeah. mill belonging to the forestry. That's now a bike hire place. You know, there's a cafe, proper cafe, and there's a proper gallery now. Which is pretty, yeah. very nice, very nice yeah. gallery. I'm definitely, I'm invited. definitely going to go to your uh, to the exhibition now. I'm yeah, really... Well, they've invited me to make a show, and it just seemed, and because they're still doing residencies there, and because the, this residency was very important to me, I thought I would focus the show around that time. So I've got drawings I made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I've had framed. I got them, dug them out out of my archive, and um, there's a drawing of the waterway I did, and then the wooden boulder was really very connected to to, to the to the wooden waterway in that I took the water to the wood in the waterway, and I've taken the wood to the water in the wooden boulder. Yeah. Then in '82, I had a project in uh, Japan. I made a river tunnel, so there's this hollowed out, burnt hollowed out log. Yeah. Which I rolled into a stream so the water runs around it and it runs through it. So that's another continuation of that theme. Yes. And I made a waterway in a, in a museum courtyard which had a, a water source running down channel yeah. diagonally across this. So from this project, I got a lot of branches and took them down and uh, we made a waterway. So that's what the show is about. There's another form based on the same principle of squaring up part of the four parts for the to make the running table which became standing frame yeah because it's really the same idea but instead of making a table or putting them flat together one can construct a square frame which is supported by branches yeah. naturally growing out it's, uh, right, it's the other pieces that, that that i that i made there was a willow ladder i'd learned that if you just stick a fresh bit of willow into the ground it doesn't matter which way up it will root. Yeah. This fret. And so I, I got two willows, uh, put them in upside down. So all their branches were going into the ground and I put rungs across the trunks. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, hoping that that would sprout, which it did. It did start to sprout, but then the deer came in at it. <laughs> um, you know, I, one, 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 one learns, but these are, these are just ideas really. And I also, I was very impressed by a big larch tree, yeah. which was growing out of a, uh, out of a slope, a hillside. At a, 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 like a great saber growth, growth it's called. It sort of swoops out of the ground. It gave it a tremendous sense of energy. Of course, the foresters really are trying to avoid that happening because they're losing a lot of wood, yeah. of, uh, of potential straight wood. So I planted, I think, nine trees, which Bill Grant rather reluctantly agreed for me to uh, do. And they were each penned to keep the deer off them. To grow in yes, as, yes. A, as a as a larch enclosure, sweeping larch sweeping enclosure, large so enclosure. growing out of a stone. But um, they died of, of uh, windburn, which I again something I didn't know about. But the yeah. the cold winter wind funnels up this space where I planted, and they they just got. Well, th these are the risks, aren't they, with working with yeah. natural materials and natural yeah, processes? And, um, one starts with a, a concept and an idea, and yeah. a lot of ignorance. 
<laughs> so it's just by trial and uh, and any and error. But I have made back here at Kind of Coed. I I did the same idea with um, Larch. Okay, it's still, I see. They're really big trees. I, I did read that you um, you laid out some ground rules. There's some here which was which was for your time in Grisdale. I don't. This was the three ground rules that I read um, that the sculpture should work with the environment using the material that the forest naturally has to offer. Um, the sculptor should acknowledge the relationship of the forest and those who work in it using their materials and tools and calling on their experience of planting, growing, tending, and cutting. And the placing of the sculptures should activate otherwise neutral spaces and not occupy areas that already have a positive sense of place. I think they were yeah. sort of three, three. Yeah, that last one was very important to me. There was a, I was horrified later in I think eighty six. I went and I there's a very beautiful little um, glade. Yeah, that was perfect. You know, empty, but the trees around it and the shape of it and the scent of being yeah. there. And there was a sculpture in the middle of it, and I thought, oh, oh. yeah, you know, and it didn't enhance the place at all. It just occupied it. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's it. But yeah, so there you go. So, so you, did you um you feel like you took a lot from the experience then at Grisdale onto your f- further practices? Because it, like it was it was in the seventies, and then in the eighties, what I gather a lot of the time in the eighties and the nineties, you were working away from Capelru quite a lot, many overseas visits and creating work in other countries. Yeah. And and did the Grisdale experience help you with this at all? And and you, you know the processes. Well, yes, it was a. It gave me that you know, a degree of confidence. Uh, I, I felt it was a successful residency on a lot of levels. And it so the idea of working where the tree fell rather than hauling bits of tree back up to my studio. Yeah. That, that, that uh, started there because you're actually working in the space of the history of that tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, only working with, with naturally available wood was an, an, another aspect of it. The show at Air Gallery, which came after it, Fletch Over Ash, which you made a little book with, that was a very important show to me because somebody saw it from a big American museum who then consequently I got included in a, in a, in a British art show there, That's which, right. you know, I was pretty, not, I wasn't very known because I was in Bliner, Bliner Festinial. Yeah. And, um, I wasn't really made, cause I've, I'd learned that if you're on a journey and it's meant to be, then, You'll meet opportunities. Yeah. I saw people making mistakes by pushing their art yeah. too hard, too soon. Yeah. And then in a way, that's what you get known for and you get sort of stuck with it. So if I'd been pushing and I was with that colored work, that's probably what I'd be making now. Yeah. You're yeah. Known for that. You get confident in that. And that your, sto- your story is amazing. The fact that, like you say, you, you could have, I mean, you're in six, you, you, you know, you're at a period in London in the sixties. When you could have easily gone down a completely different path, and yeah, so yeah. to do and to have the determination as a young man to sort of move away from that and to have that mindset is is just remarkable, and it's a testament to your whole career that you did that then, and and you're working, um, you know, the way you're working practice and and the continuation of your work, it's just it's just yeah. remarkable. Yeah, I call it determination, but it was determination, determination. to be to be free. Yeah, uh, and um, and okay. If nobody knew about the work, so long as I could keep working. I mean, yeah. that's that, that's the you know you got to have a good bottom line. Yeah. And if anything else happens above that, well, that's fine. If yeah. if you're comfortable with it, you know, if you yeah. find that that works with it, with it. I mean, I think my wife has found it, you know, through those the eighties, nineties, quite a strain because I'm away a lot. Yeah, of course. And that was really when in the, in the mid nineties I realised I've, I've got to stop doing this. <laughs> and, um, I was looking for, because I, I couldn't work, work with the chainsaw inside the chapel because of, of the fumes. Mm. So by that time, the chapel had become somewhere where it was more a depository. Um, it's since become actually an installation, but it always was a sort of an installation, but it was more a dumping ground for, for stuff. So mm. I needed a proper workshop. So and some, uh, the Welsh Development a- Agency in the eighties had built industrial estates around in all the little towns and Bliner had had one. They were finding it really hard to uh, rent the spaces. Uh, somebody rented one to create up a show to go to America. And I realized then that there was potential. I could, I could rent this thing. I could rent somewhere. Yeah. And I rented two. And then I started working outside one and the Welsh Development Agency didn't like me doing that. So 
and there, there was only one other person, but people were coming and going all the time. They, they would get the advantage of, of two years rent free and then leave. Yeah. I said, any chance of buying them? And they said, yes, please. Mm. Because they just, it was a, it was a headache, this place for them. So yeah. I bought it, you know, by Capo for a lot less. Hmm. And you would, I couldn't have built it with what I paid. No, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's just, yeah. uh, there's so many yeah, circumstances. Yeah, yeah. They've gone. Things have landed out with you, haven't you? You've yeah, embraced yeah, them. Yeah. You've embraced the only, opportunities. It's <laughs> only uh, just across the playing field from me, so it's re- it's right here. And then there was still part of the old goods yard, which had been used to make this industrial estate. And I've I've occupied. I, mean, I bought that in, in two different lots, and uh, yeah. I built more storage. So I got a proper storage unit now, which one bit is air conditioned for all the works on paper. Yes. So, uh, you know, I, I've got a sort of campus now. Yeah. I mean, I love the idea with Capel Rue, which is, I mean, we could have had a talk just literally about the whole of Ka- uh, Capel yeah, Rue yeah. itself because it's just incredible space. I love the, I love the idea that somebody sort of, um, compared it to like Kirch Vitter's merch barn or, or something yeah, like that. Yes, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that, he's, he was a great influence on me. I heard, he's yeah, oh, right. hearing a story because that an- anecdote. Yes. Um, Kirch Vitter's, he owned a building which is like a terrace that I think had five floors. He lived in the basement and he rented off each floor. They were, it wasn't big. And then he he built the first sort of Merzbaum in the basement mm. and he needed to go up. So the chap above him had moved out. So he just occupied that. So he he just moved up through the house and, and he connected it through the floor until actually he got occupied the whole building. I think it was pulled down eventually or was bombed. The irony was that it was dependent on the rent. The bigger his work grew, the, the lower his income. <laughs> yeah, but, but thank you, David. Just thank you again for doing this today. It's been uh, it's been a real honour to speak to you, and um, you know, and hope, hopefully I'll speak to you again soon. I just wanted to end with a quote, if that's okay, which was from yourself in 1978. Um, which obviously was, uh, you know, it's where we've got to. I mean, obviously you've gone on and you've had so many amazing exhibitions post Grisdale and you've been around the world in Europe, you know, in an RA, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park exhibition in 2010 was huge and was an amazing one. And then Q and all the rest of it. But I'll just end with this quote from 1978. And what you said was, I want a simple approach to living and doing. I want a life and work that reflects the balance and continuity of nature, identifying with the time and energy of the tree and with its mortality. I find myself drawn deeper into the joys and blows of nature, worn down and regenerated, broken off and reunited. Dormant faith is revived in the new growth of old wood. I absolutely love that. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. And I will speak to you soon. Yeah. yeah. And we'll keep, we'll keep in touch, yeah. hopefully. Okay. Well, I hope you'll come and, and visit. Oh, when God. You, you, when honestly. It's, when it's possible, possible. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're on Angle C in, um, we're on Angle C in August. So I will be in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. Thank you. And I'll, I'll take care okay. and have a nice rest of the day. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. David Nash on the Northern Art Podcast. How cool was that? Just a few things that I thought I should mention as an appendix to today's episode. The Wooden Boulder film can be seen at the gallery in Clan Bedrog in North Wales. The current Grisdale Forest exhibition is on from June until mid-December 2021. Check out grisdalesculpture.org for details. Ash dieback is a disease we talked about that has affected the ash dome. David talked about planting oak in a second ring around the ash. The Woodland Trust have predicted that ash dieback will kill around 80% of ash trees in the UK at a cost of billions. It will change the landscape forever and threaten many species which rely upon ash. Thank you for listening and I hope that you've enjoyed it. As usual, I'll post some images relating to the episode on the Northern Art Facebook page and on the Instagram page too. Any likes, comments, shares, messages, follows, etc. is always appreciated. You can also subscribe to the channel on Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and then you won't miss out on any episodes that I upload in the future.